Imagine it's the summer after high school graduation, the perfect time for pool parties, part-time jobs, binge-watching TV shows, and hanging out with friends. For one friend group, it was the perfect Friday afternoon. They were relaxing on the couch at a friend's house, watching TV, and hanging out. But soon, there would be a knock at the door, and what was waiting on the other side was what nightmares are made of, and it changed their lives forever. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 17 of the Dark Levity Podcast. I'm your host, Kimberlea, and I'm here with my co-host, my best friend, my partner in crime, Jonathan, my fiance. Hi. Sorry, <laughs> forgot at that time. Dark Levity. It's the dark downward slope into the degradation of the human mind and the consequences that such darkness brings to light. And this case truly highlights darkness in the most shocking ways. And for today's case, we're taking you to Texas. But before we jump in, please make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell, so you know when you will be seeing our faces next. I'm nearing the end of my pregnancy, so our schedule is a little less organized. Today's case has been covered a number of times in the media and all over, different podcasts and shows. But I have to say that every time I hear about this case, I feel like it's all about the perpetrator and I know them so well, but I don't get to know anything about the victims and there is more than one, sadly. And if you watch our content before, we are very victim focused. So if you have heard this case, I'd encourage you to keep watching because we may bring a new perspective that you haven't heard yet. That being said, there are a lot of names associated with this case since it does involve multiple victims, but to make it easier right up front, the most important names for you to remember are Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus, and Adelbert. We're going to start by introducing you to Rachel Ann Kalarudis. She was born on November 20th, 1984 to her parents, Diane, who went by Anne, and George. She had one older brother, Justin, and an older sister named Tiffany, who was closer to her in age. Now, this is not the Tiffany that we want you to remember, but she is still important as Rachel's sister. They had a large extended family with many aunts and uncles, and Rachel and Tiffany did everything together growing up, and they grew up in the greater Houston area in Texas. They had wild imaginations and would play house, making up funny voices for all their different characters, and they would hang out in their yard in their Clear Lake City home. We want to tell you more about Clear Lake. It's a huge master plan community in Houston. Now, Houston is the largest city in Texas and the fourth largest city in the U.S. So many kids are raised in communities like Clear Lake. What makes Clear Lake so special is the close proximity to the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center and the Ellington Air Force Base which is populated by wealthy engineers and scientists. To better understand the size of Clear Lake, it has over 16 neighborhoods and five high schools. Yeah, that's pretty large because I remember growing up in Fort Lauderdale. I feel like it was similar there. We had at least a few high schools close by to where I live too. But growing up, Rachel was an artistic child and very family oriented. She went to church every Sunday and she was proud to be a Texan. I've actually heard that kids in Texas say the Pledge of Allegiance to the Texas flag. Every morning? Is that true? Any Texans out there care to let us know? But Rachel grew up drawing, painting, and doing ballet, and she loved to read and write stories. She was excited about everything. When Rachel was nine, she and her older sister Tiffany got to meet their baby sister, Samantha, and Rachel happily looked after her little sister and helped her mother take care of responsibilities around the house. After she entered middle school, Rachel became the neighborhood babysitter and led events through Clear Creek Community Church, including Bible school and theater productions. Kids loved her and they looked up to her. She was beautiful inside and out and had a magnetic personality that just commanded attention. You could trust Rachel to be responsible, hardworking, and independent. But when you're independent at such a young age, that can be frustrating for everyone involved. Rachel felt ready to go off into the world by herself, but her parents, George and Anne, knew that the world was not always a safe place for a 15-year-old girl. Rachel would have fights and disagreements with her mom about curfew and phone bills. I mean, didn't we all as teenagers? 
but they all loved one another. But things could get pretty tense at home. And in high school, Rachel would go on joy rides with her dad on his Harley motorcycle. And her older brother, Justin, got married and had kids, which meant Rachel was already an auntie. And Tiffany and Rachel were as close as ever. One fond memory that they shared was they would drive to the grocery store together and they would sit in the car, making up stories about the people who walked by and they would laugh until they cried. And I do this too. I give voices. I do too. <laughs> and kind of narrate the moment. And Shiloh really likes when we do that. It's kind of funny and cute. So that really reminded me of how we are. Rachel thrived at Clear Lake High School. She was a natural leader and could make friends with anyone. She was beautiful and everyone thought she could be a model. However, Rachel didn't want to be a model. She actually wanted to work in criminal justice. She was a fan of James Patterson novels and was fascinated with the way criminals think. Above all else, Rachel wanted to help people. Out of high school, Rachel was talented at creative writing and cooking. She worked part-time during her school year and full-time during the summers as a server at Denny's. She also worked at Randall's grocery store as a clerk a UPS store representative, and a youth counselor at a vacation Bible school. Rachel was an exemplary employee. She cared about what she did. As a senior, Rachel didn't have concrete plans for the future, but she did have some big ideas. She wanted to go to college, maybe join the U.S. Air Force. Nobody had any doubt that Rachel would succeed in whatever she set her mind to. I had a lot of random jobs too like that. Me too. And I would quit within two weeks. By May of 2003, Rachel had graduated from Clear Lake High and her best friend Tiffany Rowell was right by her side. Yes, this is the other Tiffany, not Rachel's sister, but the close friend that we want you to remember. Rachel and Tiffany had gotten to know each other from sitting together at lunch during high school. They had a large group of friends, Lauren, Christine, Jennifer, and Rachel's sister, Tiffany. But Tiffany Rowell was Rachel's best friend in the whole world. And we want to tell you more about Tiffany Nicole Rowell. She was born on April 24th of 1985 in Travis County, Texas. She was actually adopted by Sally Louise Schroeder and Chester Rowell, who had sadly lost their one-month-old daughter, Emily Rose, the year before. Sally and Chester had another daughter, Tracy, but they wanted a baby girl so badly. So adopting Tiffany was the best thing they ever did. Tiffany was surrounded by music growing up. Sally was a performance violinist at Theater Under the Stars Orchestra and the Houston Ballet. She was the orchestra director at Clear Lake High School until 1998. Chester had his PhD and taught music at SJCC, which is the San Jacinto Community College, including private clarinet lessons. And Tiffany was musically gifted, but her true passion was acting. Tiffany tried out for all the school plays in middle school and high school. She loved watching movies and TV because she wished to be an actress. Though living in Houston instead of New York or Hollywood made it pretty difficult. Tiffany was a star. She was animated, motivated, self-assured, and kind-hearted. When her friends were feeling insecure, Tiffany was the one to give them a pep talk. Sadly, tragedy struck. When Tiffany was 13, her adopted mother, Sally, passed away at the age of 52. Sally was diagnosed with lung cancer, and she passed away very quickly. Tiffany went through an intense grieving period and leaned on her best friend, Rachel. Even after years passed, Rachel always listened to stories about Sally and supported her friend no matter what. At that age, not everyone understands grief. The idea that grief stays with you forever doesn't make sense to some, but Rachel understood. Tiffany and Rachel had a lot in common. Tiffany was also interested in psychology and wanted to attend college to study social work and to become a therapist. She and Rachel were into all the same things girls their age are usually into, makeup, dating, and parties. Right. It's all the things that make high school fun. And that definitely brings me back to the old days when I would sit on my best friend's bed, doing my makeup and talking about boys or watching MTV, MTV all day long. Me and my friends just skateboarded. Tiffany started dating a guy named Marcus early on in high school. Another important name that you're going to want to remember. And Rachel was the first person Tiffany confided in about Marcus. By the summer of 2003, Tiffany and Marcus had been dating for three years and were going strong. By the time Tiffany and Rachel graduated, Tiffany's older sister had three kids and Tiffany's dad remarried. So a lot happened in the girls' lives, but they remained each other's shoulders to lean on. Now, let me tell you about Marcus, Tiffany's boyfriend. Marcus Ray Priscilla was born on August 29th, 1983. His family called him Marky. 
His parents were Charlene and Marty Priscilla, and Marcus had an older sister named Marie. Charlene and Marty were not together very long, and Charlene remarried Marcus's stepdad, David Gronwald. Marcus even called David his dad. The family was a big one. Marcus had seven uncles, ten aunts, and a bunch of cousins. And once he and his sister Marie were older, he had a little nephew named Caden. Marcus was a kid who would go up to strangers and say hi. He wanted to be friends with everyone. He was kind, gentle, and generous. He struggled with high school, but was determined to work hard and start a career and a family. Marcus went to an alternative high school and graduated in 2000, then enrolling at SJCC, where Tiffany's dad worked. Marcus achieved his automotive technology certificate, and in 2003, he enrolled in fall classes for a business degree. Marcus's plan was to run his own business and fixing and restoring cars. He was a car fanatic. He loved old cars. He would do detailing and he loved working on his own car, which he had fixed up pretty well. When he wasn't focused on his career, Marcus was working. He worked part-time at Kroger and then in 2003, he was serving food at the Landry Seafood House. Marcus was compassionate, but he also had a bit of a wild streak. His coworker Diedrich called him cool and crazy. Marcus had this unique energy that people were just drawn to, and of course, especially his girlfriend Tiffany. Marcus and Tiffany were a perfect match. Marcus's sister Marie said that in the four years they were together, they took care of one another and never left each other's side. Their happiness was contagious. You could spend 10 minutes with a couple, and it was undeniable that they were in it for the long haul. And in the summer of 2003, Marcus actually moved in with Tiffany, but he was still visiting his parents and his sister's house on a regular basis. One of Marcus's cousins is another important person for you to remember. His name is Adelbert Nicholas Sanchez. While Tiffany and Rachel were 18, Marcus was 19 and Adelbert was slightly older at 21. He was born on May 12th of 1982 and he and Marcus were super close. They actually called him Del or D. His biological parents were Ruben Sanchez and Joanne Priscilla. When Del was young, Ruben married Del's stepmom Maricela, who was very close with her son. Del had an older sister named Melissa and a younger sister named Nicole, and he spent his childhood in Texas surrounded by his cousins. They'd be in the yard, Del would be with his sister Melissa, his cousin Lori, and their cousin Keith, and suddenly they would just team up on each other and run around and attack each other. Melissa was a great older sister. She took care of Del and gave him advice when he needed it, and she would also punch him when he deserved it. Nicole thought Del was her hero. She looked up to him and his confidence. Dell went to MacArthur and W.T. Hall High Schools. He was hardworking and kept his grades up. His closest friend was a guy named Sergio, and they would hang out in the friend group dancing and just goofing off and having a good time together. Dell was tall, and girls thought he was handsome, popular, sweet, talented, fashionable, and with a heart of gold. People who knew him said that he had one of those laughs that you found yourself just laughing at, like the contagious laugh that makes you laugh even if it's not funny, that was him. Dell's primary passion was music. He loved rap and wrote an album himself, even burning several CDs. I don't know if many people know this, but you are actually very musical. He just got done helping me make the intro to my Evil Minds series yeah. that's coming to my main channel. Yeah, I love but music. he does everything. He produces, he used to be in a band. Mm -hmm. Signed, traveled, toured. Signed, sealed, delivered. Yes. But back to Dell, of course. Dell was still at his home in North Houston when he graduated high school, hoping his career would take off. He had undeniable talent and sang with a local group. However, the music industry is pretty hard to break into, but Dell had a plan to study computer science in college as a backup plan. Dell loved spending time with his family and was generous. One time, Dell helped his friend's friend move apartments in the middle of the night, and he did it, no questions asked. He was a good friend, and at 21, he had the advantage of being able to buy alcohol. So if a friend like Marcus asked Dell to buy some alcohol, he'd happily agree. His favorite drink was Bud Light. And I know there are going to be some who comment that maybe we're condoning breaking the law, discussing underage drinking. There are definitely worse laws to break than drinking a beer at 18 years old. In other countries, it's completely legal. But I do still want to point out that it can be dangerous. And we want to remind you that just because we discuss something, it doesn't mean we agree with it. We're just giving you the facts. I only drank once when I was underage and I regretted it. Let me tell you. I tried my first beer underage. It was a Newcastle 
Oh, as your first beer, that's bad. Mine was gin and juice. I don't want to get started with it. In July of 2003, the four individuals we told you to remember, Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus, and Dell, hung out constantly. They were all very close. Tiffany's dad, Chester, had remarried a woman named Christine when Tiffany was still in high school. He had decided to move out of the family home and into an area called Manville, a 40-minute drive away. Initially, he invited Tiffany to come live with him, but she wanted to stay in Clear Lake with her friends. Tiffany was responsible, and her dad trusted her to take care of herself. After all, she was an adult at 18, so Tiffany was allowed to remain in the family home, located at 3705 Millbridge Drive in the Brook Forest subdivision in Clear Lake. The house was a small, tan, wood and brick accented home on a cul-de-sac. And that summer, Tiffany invited Marcus and her best friend Rachel to move in with her. Rachel had gotten in a fight with her parents regarding bills and her independence, so she left at the beginning of July to get some space. And on July 11th, Dell moved into Marcus's place to sleep on the couch. And by July 16th, Tiffany's house was known as the place to go hang out and party. And I mean, it does sound like the perfect place for fun away from the watchful eye of parents and older adults. And when they weren't throwing a party, the kids were all working. Rachel and Tiffany had jobs as servers and bartenders. They would carpool together to Club Exotica, which is an adult-centered nightclub on the Gulf Freeway. It's actually a topless bar, to be more exact. And when I looked it up, it was listed as a pasty bar. So there you go. And think what you will, but these were two young women and they thought it was a lot of fun. They didn't have plans to become dancers, but they did like hanging out with the other girls who were. They were all young women who liked to go out and have a little fun. One day the girls were carpooling to work and they actually saw Rachel's dad, George, riding his Harley and Rachel waved and Tiffany blew George a kiss. Rachel had cooled off over the past few weeks about her cell phone disagreement and she sent her dad an email saying, quote, I don't know when I can face y'all. There are many times I want to pick up the phone, but I'm just not able to. I love you all, and I will try to get up the courage to call, end quote. It was a transitional period in Rachel's life, and she had messaged her mom, Anne, that she wanted to reconnect as well. But Rachel never got that chance because sadly, that was the last time her father saw her. On July 16th, Tiffany's friend Kyle went to hang out at her house. They ordered pizza and watched movies. Everything was ordinary. Nothing seemed wrong at all. The next night, on July 17th, Marcus and Dell went to a party while Rachel and Tiffany worked into the early hours of the morning. The bar usually closed around 2 a.m. and then they need help closing it up. Marcus and Dell left the party and went back to Tiffany's. They brought their two friends who slept over, but they left in the morning on the 18th. Marcus and Dell woke up on Friday morning, and Rachel and Tiffany were still asleep until 2 in the afternoon. Which is very common when you work those very odd hours into the early morning. When the girls woke up, they went to the living room to hang out with Marcus and Dell and talk about their plans for the evening. Rachel and Tiffany were supposed to be at work by 6 p.m. Tiffany went to the bathroom and came back. Rachel got up to microwave her lunch, and that's when everyone heard someone at the door. While Tiffany was in the bathroom, one of her friends called her cell phone around 3 p.m. I have searched everywhere for this friend's name with no luck, and I believe it's because they do want to stay anonymous, so we're going to call her Bella for context. When Bella called Tiffany, Marcus picked up her cell phone. He said Tiffany was in the bathroom and to call back in a couple minutes. Bella did call back, again and again, and nobody answered. This was highly unusual for Tiffany not to pick up her phone for three hours. Around 5.30 p.m., Bella was driving in her car with her boyfriend, his cousin, and her nephew. They went to McDonald's to get a bite to eat and then decided to go over Tiffany's to check on her. When Bella pulled up, Tiffany and Marcus's cars were both parked on the curb outside the house. Bella rang the doorbell. She knocked. Nobody answered. She started looking in the windows and started banging on the door and hit it so hard that it opened up just a crack. It hadn't been locked. But she didn't think simply to open it up without knocking. Bella called out Tiffany's name as she walked through the entrance hallway saying, Tiff, are you here? It was very quiet. A disturbing type of quiet, the type where your gut tells you something isn't right, and there was a smell of metallic in the air. As she turned into the living room, whatever she saw was so horrific that she ran out the door screaming, Call the cops! 
Bella's boyfriend had been waiting in the car, but when Bella screamed, she actually collapsed on the grass. So of course he got out and went inside the house to see what was going on. That's when he saw all the blood inside the house and sprinted back outside yelling for the neighbors to help and repeating what Bella had screamed, call the cops. The neighbors across the street were Angel, Amador, and Doyle Smith. They were already outside. One of them was taking a call when two teenagers came running and screaming from Tiffany's yard saying something happened to their friends and it was bad. They may have been shot, but they weren't sure. It was a very frantic moment. So Angel and Doyle went inside Tiffany's and they were confronted with a horrific scene in the living room. The TV was still on and they recognized Tiffany and they saw her and one of her friends on the couch. Tiffany had her feet propped up on a nearby recliner and at first... It looked like they were just sleeping or had passed out from alcohol or drugs, but there was just so much blood and they weren't the only victims. They saw one kid lying on the opposite side of the couch from the room's entrance and the other was in front of the TV face down with her legs crossed and one of her arms outstretched like she had been reaching for something. I cannot even imagine stumbling upon something like that. It's one of my biggest fears. Yeah, me neither. And Angel had known the Rowell family since Tiffany was only 10 years old. He and Doyle immediately called 911 and reported their neighbor and her friends were dead. They told the dispatcher that there were pizza boxes and beer cans all over the floor, so they thought the kids were having a party when someone broke in the house and killed them in cold blood. Angel and Doyle waited outside with Bella and her friends, wondering who would do something like this. These kids were so young. And Tiffany was a good kid. She was kind, polite, and as far as the neighbors knew, she didn't have any enemies. One thing was for sure, there was a killer in Clear Lake, and that meant that no one was safe. Police showed up, along with four vehicles from the coroner's office, and a dozen of neighbors waited outside the crime scene, trying to figure out what had happened. And it's definitely not every day that you see something like this in your own neighborhood. The crime scene tape, a coroner's van... I mean, I would be freaking out and I would definitely want to know what's happening and if we're in any danger. I would definitely go over and look. Sergeant Tom Ladd was put in charge of the case with his partner, Phil Yockham. With additional assistance from Sergeant Brian Harris, Breck McDaniel, and Tom McCorvey. When investigators arrived, they had no idea what to expect, but they talked to Bella, Angel, and Doyle outside. Bella was more familiar with the friend group and told them that Tiffany's friends were Rachel, Marcus, and Dell. When investigators walked into the house, the first thing they saw were nine bullet shells right in the front entranceway. It appeared that whoever entered the house started shooting immediately. A pink cell phone was plugged into an electrical socket near the rack of shoes. As police turned left into the living room, they found blood on the carpet, walls, couch, TV, and fireplace. Bullets had gone through the windows, blinds, the walls. There were papers everywhere, magazines, Sprite cans, pizza boxes, and enough stuff that it looked like a struggle or the perpetrator had ransacked the house looking for something. We want to show you an example of the positions in which all of the friends were found. Rachel was lying face down in the front of the TV. She seemed to be crawling forward based on her hand, which was outstretched to the leg of the armchair nearby. Under that armchair was another cell phone with blood in the pattern on the screen that matched the numbers 911. This showed that Rachel tried to call for help. She had the worst wounds out of everyone. She'd been shot repeatedly in the torso, legs, and in her thighs, and someone had bludgeoned her in the head, which caused droplets of blood to spray all over the nearby walls. Tiffany and Dell were on the couch with an armrest position between them. They'd both been shot multiple times in the head and torso. From their relaxed positions sitting down on the couch, it looked like they had been caught off guard. Marcus was between the fireplace and the right armrest of the couch closer to where Dell was sitting. There was a trail of blood on the carpet leading up to the fireplace and droplets on both the fireplace itself and the couch arm. Marcus had either tried to avoid being hit or he fought back. It was hard to tell without a forensic examination. The four bodies were taken to the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office for identification. The authorities began taking pictures of the bullet casings and collecting evidence. Now, we do have some pictures of this crime scene. We might have to blur some things because this is a very gruesome scene. There were over 15 shells at the crime scene. And by the way that the kids were wounded, it appeared there were more wounds than shell casings, which meant A, the killer cleaned up some of the shells, or B, 
two weapons were used, and one was either a shotgun or a revolver, which don't leave casings behind. Sergeant Harris thought there was a personal relationship between the killer and the four friends because there was just so much blood, so many wounds. This was a textbook case of overkill. Also, Tiffany and Rachel were the only two victims shot between the legs. It almost appeared as though the perpetrator targeted them in some sexual manner. It was just a strange place to shoot someone. It seemed very intentional. Yeah, that was really telling. And they wondered, was this an angry, possessive man, an ex-boyfriend? Was it jealousy? Police couldn't be sure. As they investigated the rest of the house, they found leftover spaghetti on the kitchen counter and plenty of cash and marijuana, which made it less likely that it was a robbery. There was no sign of forced entry, but then again, the door was unlocked. Based on the shell casings around the door, police inferred that Rachel was making herself lunch and that she was the one who actually answered the door. The person at the door was wielding a gun and Rachel ran but was severely injured and fell in front of the TV. The rest of the friend group was killed quickly right after Rachel was shot. If there was something taken from the house, they weren't sure what it could be. The house was swabbed for DNA evidence and searched for fingerprints. At this point, the families of Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus, and Dell were informed about the crime. They loaded into their vehicles and sped to Tiffany's house on Millbridge Drive. Police had to keep Rachel's parents, George and Anne, from entering the house. They broke down, begging to know whether one of the people dead inside was their daughter. And that is just heartbreaking. I can't even imagine because you know they're not going to let them see what's inside that house. Nicole Sanchez, Dell's sister, said that evening was a nightmare. She needed answers, but it was too early for the police to have any leads. Marcus and Dell's friends, who had been sleeping over at that house that morning, felt survivor's guilt, knowing that they could have been there, but they left. Maybe they could have stopped this. Or maybe they would have ended up dead, or they could be responsible in some way. Anything was possible at this point. So police talked to neighbors and families gathered outside. Most neighbors hadn't heard any gunshots, which was surprising considering a gun or guns had been fired in rapid succession. And I'm kind of surprised when neighbors don't hear anything, but I also understand that we're preoccupied watching TV or we're on our phones. So sometimes it just doesn't register until later. Craig and Michelle Lackner lived right next door and they hadn't heard any shots but they had seen two people walking close to Tiffany's house at approximately 3.15 p.m. that day. Michelle's dog had been barking, so she called out to Craig to let the dog inside. And when Craig opened the side door, he said he recalled seeing a young man and woman walking toward Tiffany's residence. The woman was wearing what looked like maybe a black bandana over her straight blonde hair. She was wearing a black shirt, white shorts, and platform sandals. She was approximately 5'7". She had a pale complexion. She was slim, and she was holding a black handbag. The young man was about the same height, if not shorter, with blonde hair as well and dark clothing on. Well, this made sense for the timeline. Bella told the cops she had called Tiffany at 3 o'clock and Marcus had picked up. But when she called back around 3.30 and even 4, nobody answered, which meant the murders could have occurred as early as between 3.05 and 3.30. But then again, it could have been later. But the Lackner's description of the two people entering made sense. If two guns had been used, one of them being a revolver or shotgun, it would explain the number of bullets at the crime scene. And it would be easier for two perpetrators to kill four people quickly than just one. But these two people that came inside just could have been friends of the group who left before they were killed. So Craig and Michelle were taken to the station to give descriptions and a sketch artist, Lois Gibson, drew composites of the young man and woman. When talking with friends and family, police found out that Rachel and Tiffany did work at Club Exotica. So they were thinking that maybe they could have been targeted by someone who had gone to the club or worked there. The two girls liked their job, but those kind of establishments can attract a dangerous crowd. Also, neighbors had reported seeing young people going up to Tiffany's front door and then leaving quickly all the time, which to police meant that people were buying drugs. People speculated that Marcus sold marijuana, ecstasy, and cocaine. Now, these were young people in the party scene living on their own. They'd probably all experimented with drugs. And as we know, experimentation is a natural part of many people's lives growing up. But teenagers don't always make the safest decisions. Police were interested in these allegations because that meant there could be a motive. If Marcus kept harder drugs in the house, someone could have robbed him and decided to leave no witnesses. If he was mixed up in a bad crowd, 
he might have been in danger. Even if it wasn't harder drugs, like even if it was just marijuana. But that didn't explain the injuries to Rachel and Tiffany's inner legs and why Rachel had willingly opened the door. If it was a drug deal gone wrong, they wondered how Tiffany and Rachel could have been involved. Kyle, one of Tiffany's friends, said that Tiffany always smiled at everyone and she didn't have an enemy in the world. He said Marcus had connections in shady places, but he was a good guy. And Rachel was the most popular girl in her graduating class. Dell was a sweetheart, so why would anyone want to hurt them? Harold C. Journey and Rudy Flores were in charge of the medical examinations and autopsy reports, which came back a week later. Now, I'm going to start, and John can help me out because there is a lot to get through, but it's very important that you understand this. So I will go in order of how the victims might have been shot, starting with Rachel. She had been shot 10 times. 10 She had been hit five times in the thighs and inner thigh and pelvic region, three times in the left shin, once in her right foot, and once in her left glute. Now, the shot to her glute and the fact that most of these shots had hit her from behind indicated she was most likely running away from her killer. She likely sustained internal bleeding from the shots to her pelvic region. She also had bruising across her body from falling to the floor, bruising on her left hand, and some of her own hair was found in her right hand. Even worse, Rachel had sustained blunt force injuries to her head with an unknown weapon. Her head had been struck so hard that she had lacerations and part of her brain was exposed. Based on the bruising and the hair in her hands, she had tried to protect her head and she tried to dial 911. So it seemed Rachel had been the last to pass away and the perpetrator had hurt her, hurt her friends and come back to make sure Rachel didn't call for help. In one of Rachel's hands, they found a strand of blonde synthetic hair, as in it wasn't from a human source, but more of like a wig or weave. Then there was Tiffany. She had a gunshot wound in the center of her forehead, her chin, and her left cheek. Different reports claim she had wounds to her left abdomen, left shoulder, right shoulder, left inner thigh, right thigh, right forearm, right knee, left leg, and right shin. Yeah, I have actually read some conflicting reports, so I'm not sure how many times she was shot, but it was a lot, and her white shirt was soaked in blood. Dell was sitting next to her, and he also had a bullet in the very center of his forehead. He had a shot to the side of his head at very close range, which caused gunpowder burns in a circle around the entrance wound. He'd also been shot in the neck, the left arm, the left shoulder, and twice in the torso. Marcus had been found lying on his side, and he had been shot five times in the abdomen, right arm, right shoulder, the head, and a graze across his chest. They knew that Marcus had been shot at a closer range because he had a lot of gunpowder burns, but he also sustained blunt force trauma to his head. He had abrasions to his right temple and five lacerations on the back of his head, also with a questionable murder weapon. Clearly, this was very in your face, and these victims had excessive damage. There were also two types of bullets found at the crime scene, meaning two guns were used. And if the neighbors, the Lackners, were correct, there were two perpetrators. One type of bullet was a 9mm, belonging to a semi-automatic pistol that could shoot up to 16 rounds. The other was a 38 caliber bullet belonging to a revolver. So of course, this is why there were no casings found from the revolver. In total, over 30 bullets were shot, with most of them hitting their mark. Only about five bullets went astray. So what that tells me is that the people who did this, they knew how to use a gun. In the weeks after the murders, more neighbors came forward with tips. One thought they had heard fireworks, but now they believe it was gunfire. At the time, it sounded like a loud banging noise between 3 and 3.30 p.m. So there's another person now saying that there was something going on during that time frame. But a different neighbor reported that around 2.30 p.m., they saw two young people enter the home wearing all black. And this struck the neighbor as weird because it was in the middle of the day in July in Texas, and it was hot and humid. And they were like, no one in their right mind would ever wear black. Well, unless maybe you're you and I, because that's pretty much our entire wardrobe. But for the average person, yes, that would be kind of peculiar. And the neighbor said, the woman was wearing a black cap over blonde hair and carried a black handbag. The man also had blonde hair and he was white. Investigators processed Rachel's phone, the one she had been reaching for at the time of her death. At 3.12 p.m. on Friday, July 18th, 2003, she made a call, an unsuccessful attempt to dial 911, 
which narrowed the time of the massacre to 3.10 that afternoon. There were no fingerprints at the crime scene that led to a perpetrator. DNA was still being processed, but the crime appeared to have happened so quickly, it was unlikely the perpetrators left much evidence behind. Police went to Clear Lake High School to interview dozens of friends and acquaintances of the victims. Everyone Sergeant Ladd and Harris interviewed had solid alibis. After all, at 3.10 on a Friday in this summer, everyone was at work. They put out a call for tips and released the composites of the young man and woman to the public. Over 400 tips came in, but nothing the police didn't already know. On Monday, August 14th, friends and family gathered for a candlelight vigil outside of Tiffany's home where the murders occurred. They brought flowers and pictures of the four friends, and they talked about all their favorite memories. Tiffany's brother-in-law, Henry, said that life is short, and her death was a reminder to pursue your passions. Tiffany was a go-getter. She auditioned for everything, and she didn't let rejection get her down. Nicole said that losing Dell, her older brother, was unbelievable. She missed him so much, and she was still listening to his songs that he had made on repeat. She said that he could have been famous— and Marcus could have owned his own car shop, and Rachel could have been in law enforcement taking on homicide cases. The loss of these young adults hit hard. Rachel's dad, George, was a champion in the search for justice. He set up mass emails, printed hundreds of flyers, and canvassed neighborhoods raising money to contribute to a reward. He and the rest of the families were able to raise $100,000. The reward was posted on a dozen Houston billboards, along with the composite sketches of the perpetrators. The pictures were posted in local and state newspapers. He and Ann participated in multiple interviews. He hoped that more he got out of the community, the more likely the perpetrators would feel guilty and perhaps confess, or a tip would come in to crack open the case. Tiffany's father, Chester, on the other hand, could not speak publicly about her death. The grief and guilt were so great that he needed to grieve in private. Marcella, Dell's mom, said she had no words to convey her pain and heartbreak. Marcus's dad, David, said his faith in humanity would never return to what it once was. Marcus and Dell's sisters would post updates on their online obituaries writing about what happened in their day-to-day -day lives and how much they missed their brothers. The wait for justice was excruciating, and despite the $100,000 reward, a year slipped by without any movement in the case. If you don't know Houston PD, it has understaffing issues. There is a high murder rate and they don't have enough people to solve all the crimes, which means they rely heavily on tips from the public. When the DNA evidence came back with no leads and none of the tips panned out, the case went cold. Sergeant Ladd retired in the beginning of 2004, and the case was taken over by Sergeant Wayman Allen. He re-interviewed Marcus and Dell's friends, you know, the two people who had stayed the night after the party and left the morning of the murders. They were cleared from suspicion. He worked with Sergeant Harris to re-interview all the people who gave statements. In May 2004, someone called Crime Stoppers and said they saw two people walking to Tiffany's house at 3 p.m. wearing black. But this didn't provide any new information. For the two-year anniversary, the news covered covered stories about it, but it was no use. Then randomly in July 2006, a man anonymously called Crime Stoppers and said he knew the murderer. While he was at Starlight, a drug rehabilitation center in Center Point, Texas, one of the women confessed to killing four people in Clear Lake. In a calm, clear voice, the man explained she and her boyfriend went to her friend's house to pick up drugs and then shot four people. They left and went back to make sure everyone was dead. She found her friend Rachel crawling in front of the TV, calling for help, and hit Rachel over the head with her gun. Wow, but it is common for prisoners or people in rehab centers or halfway houses to come up with these outlander stories and talk about how they committed all these murders for attention. But the anonymous tipster knew a lot more about Rachel's murder than anyone could have known from the newspapers or the media. He said that the woman's name who told him this was Christine and her boyfriend's name was Chris. So the Houston PD looked into Christine's from Starlight and found a Christine Paolilla who was recovering from a heroin addiction. And she was 20 years old at that time. And she was living with her husband, Justin Rott, in Arlington. She had once lived in the Houston area, but moved after Hurricane Rita hit in 2005. It was the best lead that they had at the time, but they found out that Christine wasn't living in Arlington. Her mom, Lori, and her stepdad, Tom, lived in Friendswood, Texas, and they said they hadn't heard from Christine in months, and they were worried. Christine was dealing with an active addiction, and it was possible that she was in harm's way. 
With Tom's help, police were able to look up Christine's credit cards and bank statements and find her location. She frequented ATMs in San Antonio, Texas, and was paying for a home at the La Quinta Motel. Two days after this tip, Sergeant Harris and McDaniel drove to San Antonio, and at 11.55 a.m., they broke into the motel room shouting, Houston, homicide! And what they found in this room was a disaster. Christine and her husband, Justin, were in the dirtiest room you can possibly imagine with a dog. And this poor dog, there were hundreds of used needles in this room, around 70 vials of heroin. There were sheets and all kinds of dirty clothing scattered all over the room, and it smelled really bad in there. There were junk food wrappers, blood on the walls. The dog had pooped everywhere. And Christine and Justin, they were not in a state of mind where they could even take the dogs on walks. Christine was wearing a shirt with blood on it, and you could tell she was obviously intoxicated. Christine and Justin were both arrested, but not for heroin possession, which was surprising to me. But Justin had an outstanding warrant against him, so that was easy to take him into custody. He had been charged for shoplifting and didn't show up to court, so he was taken in. Christine was arrested on charges of first-degree murder because of the tip that the man called in. There was just too much about the murder that this person knew for Christine not to have been involved. Christine was taken to the San Antonio Police Department for questioning. Police needed to figure out who her ex-boyfriend was so they could arrest him as well. So Sergeant Harris brought Christine into an interview room and he said he wanted to talk about Rachel and Tiffany, two girls that she had once gone to high school with. They had a long conversation. Harris didn't record the first hour and a half, but he did record from 2.45 p.m. to 3.56 p.m. And during that time, Christine was read her rights. She did not request an attorney and she was not threatened and she did not appear intoxicated. We, of course, are going to play parts of this interview for you in just a bit, but Christine has a gentle voice. She pauses often and she says, um, a lot. When she was asked who Rachel and Tiffany were to her, she said that they were her best friends in high school. But before we get into this interview, let's give you some backstory on who Christine is. Christine Marie Paolilla was born on March 31st, 1986 in New York City, making her one year younger than Rachel and Tiffany. She had a brother named John, and her biological dad Charles was a construction worker until he passed away on the job when Christine was only two. This was devastating for the Paolilla family. They moved to Friendswood, Texas, 17 minutes from Clear Lake, and Christine's mother, Lori, battled addiction to heroin. So Christine and her brother lived with their grandparents until Lori was in recovery. During that time, Christine's stress levels were so bad her hair began to fall out. She was diagnosed with alopecia. Alopecia looks different for everyone. Some hair loss occurs when they're sick or stressed and only affects patches on the head. Others lose their eyebrows and eyelashes. Some people are completely bald. For many people, alopecia can be detrimental to their self-esteem. When Christine lost patches of her hair and her eyebrows and eyelashes, she felt ashamed. She wore wigs and makeup and thick glasses. She was a cute kid, but kids can be brutal, and Christine was bullied relentlessly. Rachel met Christine through church, and during her senior year, she took Christine under her wing. If you've watched the movie Clueless, which I'm sure a lot of you had, it's just like when Cher met Ty. Rest in peace, Brittany Murphy. I think about that all the time. I just played the soundtrack the other day, and we heard rolling with my homies. That always brings back so many memories. Rachel and Tiffany were super popular. They were pretty much two of the most popular girls at Clear Lake High School. And during high school, teenagers are immersed in their own little world. Everything means so much more to them because that's all they know. They don't realize there's a whole big world outside of high school. So it meant a lot to Christine that the cool kids were helping her. And I have to say, especially for women and even for men too. But I think men, they can get away with maybe like shaving their head. Yeah. And, but for a woman, alopecia, it's a really devastating thing to go through. It really is like losing your eyebrows and patches of your hair falling out and thinning. So this was very hard for someone like Christine to deal with at the time. Before this, Christine had drawn on eyebrows and wore cheap wigs. So Rachel ended up trying to help boost Christine's self-esteem. So she gave her a makeover and some beauty advice. She showed her how to make her eyebrows look more natural. She convinced Christine to wear contacts instead of glasses and changed her wardrobe, adding a way better quality wigs as well. 
It was like magic, but it's not. It's just fashion sense and beauty products. But Christine became popular fast, and her graduating class even voted her Miss Irresistible during their senior superlatives. These are awards that are given to high school students to recognize their unique talents and qualities. Other students cast their votes. And the most common ones that we usually hear of are most likely to succeed, best dressed. Class clown. Yes, cutest couple. But I've never heard of Miss Irresistible before. Me neither. But I'm guessing it has to do with being the most attractive guy and girl in the senior class. Let us know if you were voted something in high school. And it kind of is like a popularity contest because if no one knows you, then they can't vote for you. But people knew Christine because she started hanging out with the popular girls. Rachel, Tiffany, and Christine hung out all the time. They would send each other notes in class. They would go to parties together. They kept photographs of each other in their wallets. And what's interesting is that police already knew all of this. They had interviewed Christine before. She was close enough to Rachel that there was a photograph of her in Rachel's purse. Christine had written on it, damn, we had some crazy memories. I love you. Christine told Officer Harris she would never hurt Rachel or Tiffany. She denied going inside Tiffany's house on July 18th, but she said she was in the area. She and her boyfriend at the time, a guy named Christopher Lee Snyder, headed to Tiffany's house because they wanted to buy drugs from Marcus. Chris went into the house alone while Christine waited in the car. He came back out and then told her that he'd forgotten something. So they went back in and Chris ran into Marcus's house with a gun in his hands. But she said she never heard any gunshots. That's when Harris brought up the blonde hair that had been found at the crime scene. Because Christine had alopecia, she could have been wearing a blonde wig. And she wasn't wearing one in this interview. And I know that this video is a little grainy, but you can see that some of her scalp is showing and her eyebrows are barely there. So it seemed like at this point, we know Christine's life had gone pretty much downhill. She wasn't keeping up with her looks or caring for herself. She was heavily involved in drugs. And we already told you the condition of the hotel room she was found in. When Christine was presented with this evidence, she said she wanted to see a nurse because she was bleeding. Christine was already experiencing heroin withdrawals. Heroin has a short half-life, and by 4 p.m., she was experiencing the effects. She was hunched over and had a leaning posture that concerned Harris. Even though Christine didn't say that she was experiencing any withdrawals, Harris paused the interview. He went out to the door and spoke with Christine's husband. And at this point, Christine was caught on camera sitting straight up, shaking off her act. And going to the door to eavesdrop on Harris's conversation, she opened the door and told Justin she loved him. Sergeant McCorvey went into the room next, sitting down to Christine to make sure she didn't overhear the conversation between Justin and Harris. She told McCorvey that she was bleeding and needed emergency care. So the officers agreed to transport her to Santa Rosa Hospital. Christine received medical attention at 5 p.m. and was not bleeding. She told medical professionals that she usually took heroin every 15 minutes, which meant she had a high tolerance for narcotics. They gave her three medications at high doses, including morphine and methadone, to help with the anxiety. Harris visited her hospital bed and she appeared coherent, so he recorded another statement from 6.15 to 7.15. She probably needed to go to the hospital because she was fiending for drugs and not bleeding, and then she just said, like, I'm bleeding to try to get there. But once again, Christine denied that she had ever gone inside Tiffany's house. But now, she said, Chris had told her that he got into a fight with Marcus and he killed everyone. Harris knew Christine was leaving out important information, so he let her rest overnight and on the flight back to Houston, and the next afternoon in Houston's women's jail. But on July 20th, they picked Christine up at 3 p.m., got McDonald's, and then took her to an interview room and spoke to her for two hours. She complained about feeling sick and wanting to throw up, so they took her by ambulance to the hospital. There, Christine was treated with a drug called Librium, an anti-anxiety medication that makes you feel like you've had a few shots of alcohol. And then she slept for four hours. She was released, and at midnight, they recorded a third statement, which changed the course of this entire investigation. Now, Christine said she was there when her friends were murdered, but it was her boyfriend at the time, Chris Snyder, that was responsible for everything. Chris had been in a juvenile detention center from ages 15 to 18 for committing robbery. 
Once he left, he was on probation and moved from Kentucky to Texas, and the two began dating when Chris was about 18 or 19 and Christine was only 16. They were together until 2004, when Chris got charged with drug possession and was transferred back to Kentucky to finish out his probation. Christine said Chris's criminal history was not the worst thing about him. He was a very scary person with a violent temper, almost satanic in thoughts about killing other people or killing himself or having the police kill him. Christine confessed they had a problematic relationship. She had abandonment issues after her dad had tragically died, and she thought of Chris as a father figure. Chris did everything to ruin her self-esteem and have control over her. Once she said he pulled off her wig at school in the hallway just to embarrass her. We're going to show you a part of the interview when Harris is asking Christine about who Chris was to her. We will put captions on the screen since the audio isn't that great, but I think you're going to be able to make out what they're saying. Uh, who was Chris Snyder to you? Um, very controlling, very, um, very scary person whenever he, uh, his temper would, whenever his temper was pushed or whenever he would, um, felt he had to prove something, he would act very uh, bully-like, very um, hard-ass, kind of. And um, there's there's been times where uh, he can get almost satanic talking about um, people. Like, I wonder what it'd be like to, to kill someone. Or um, there's there's been... So many times where uh, me and him have gotten into fights and physical fights and um, very manipulative, very. Um, Let me stop. Is it, is it safe to say were you romantically involved with Chris a few years ago? Yeah. Was he your boyfriend? Yeah. How long did y'all date? Um, about a year. About a year? Almost. Okay. Um, was it a love-hate relationship? Did you have strong feelings for him? At, at first, um, it was it was a really good relationship. Then um, he started. Um, I guess once he got used to the relationship, when you know, the more like newness wore off. Yeah, he got he got very um, very take charge, very demanding, okay. and if. If he didn't get what he wanted, he would do whatever it took to, you know, get me to you know, do something for him or, you know, or say something for him or it was pretty much he, he really could. He knew that what uh, my weak spots were and um, when I would be in a weak state of mind and when uh when he really could get to me, he knew what what to say about my past, what to say personal things about me to make me um, feel very, you know, almost almost like jelly kind of insecure, very insecure, just very, you know, like nothing, very numb, very, you know, just. Okay, so it's safe to say this this man had a big effect on you, yeah. right? Um, did you did you say a father like relationship? Um, than what you said once? Yes, I did because um, I had lost my father at a very young age, and um, when I when I first uh, started dating Chris, he you know he acted like you know he was the man, you know, mm -hmm. and he would um, you know try to you know buy everything and. And just he acted. It's almost like he was a father figure to me because he'd always, you know, said he could take care of me, and and I always had that, you know, in my mind, you know, not not that like he is my father, but I that, you know, this is the dominant male in your life. Yeah, this is that that part of you know my life that was taken out once. Remember that this is Christine's version of their relationship. Who knows if she's being honest, but what about the day of the murders? Christine said on the day of the murders, she was hanging out with Chris at 1 p.m. at her mom, Lori's house. 
Chris was smoking weed and she was mad because she thought the neighbors would smell it and call the cops. Chris got angry, said he wanted to go do harder drugs, and jabbed her in the side with his elbow and she fell to the floor. Christine drove him back to his house and they argued. She went into Chris's house for a glass of water and Chris went to his stepdad's room. She thought it was to get drugs. When he came back and said it was all Christine's fault they didn't have any drugs, so now she would have to drive him to go get some. Christine said that Chris knew from the parties at Tiffany's house that Marcus Priscilla had drugs, so around 3 p.m. they showed up there. She told Chris to go buy the drugs quickly because she had to go back to work at her shift at Walgreens. She said that Chris went in and came back running out of the house. He told Christine to sit in the front passenger seat and Chris drove away. She asked him why he was running. And that's when he pulled out a Ziploc bag full of drugs. Christine asked how he was able to afford that much. Chris said they were loaned to him on credit. And now she had to drive him to go to the bank. Christine saw through this BS and Chris finally admitted to her he stole the drugs. Christine said they needed to give him back because Marcus knew bad people. And now Marcus would kick Chris's ass or worse. Well, Chris got mad at this. He said Marcus wouldn't kick his ass. Then he turned the car around and parked down the block from Tiffany's. Christine said that her and Chris argued as they walked to Tiffany's with the drugs in hand. And Chris said, I'm going to kick this guy's ass. Christine started crying, ran back to the car, stepped into the driver's seat, but couldn't leave because Chris had her keys. Chris went back to the car and threatened to toughen her up. He whipped out a gun and poked her in the side with it. Then he made her come with him to the door of the house. So according to this story, he's holding her at gunpoint in a public neighborhood in the middle of the day? I don't know about that. But she said that Rachel opened the door and now Chris had both guns concealed in his waistband. Christine followed Rachel into the house. Marcus and Dell were on the couch and Rachel went to the bathroom where Tiffany was washing her hands and Christine followed her. That's when Chris pulled out his gun and threatened Marcus, asking him for money. Marcus stood up and said he doesn't have any money, but he does have drugs, not knowing that Chris already stole the bag of drugs. Then Chris yelled for Christine to come by his side and he put a second gun in her hand and told Christine to go with Marcus to the back bedroom to get the money and drugs because he didn't want Marcus to go back there alone and bring back a gun. So Christine followed Marcus to the back bedroom, cradling the revolver against her stomach. And Marcus came back empty handed because once again, Chris already stole the drugs. As Marcus walked into the living room, Chris said to Rachel and Tiffany in a mocking voice, are you scared? All the girls were crying. Marcus said the only thing Chris was good at was making girls cry. And that is when Chris shot Marcus, according to Christine. Then Christine screamed and she said she hid behind a banister. But Chris just kept shooting. He promised to get Rachel and Tiffany if they didn't shut up. He pointed his gun at Christine and said she needed to stand with him because she was his girlfriend. He grabbed her gun, ran into the other room, ran back, and shot someone again. Christine said she closed her eyes. She felt him yank her in a standing position and put a gun in her hand. And using his hand, she said that he made her press the trigger and shoot, but she didn't hit anyone. However, she did pull the trigger and said it felt like she pulled it a million times. How ludicrous is the story though? Oh, why don't we play a portion of it right Yes, now? let's play a portion of it for you and we'll get your thoughts. So the gun was in your hand and what was he telling you? One, two, three? Uh, he was he was holding on to it to Okay, like on top of your hand or something? Yes. Like, yeah, like I, I I couldn't tell you how it was, like but that one that that um like I was scared and I was like crimping and then I uh I had made the, the gun go off, not not purposely though, but like if they went to the, like the back of the room because I was just like screaming, just like shaking. So somehow like you this. pulled the trigger. Yes. Okay. And he's like, you know, one, two, three, and he's like, come on, you, you bitch, you bitch, you bitch, and he just started just screaming at me, and then, you know, he he kept like it felt like like I was like being like jerked, like like you know like. <sighs> Was violent when the when it goes off. Mm -hmm. How many times do you think it went off in your hand? A million times. It, it went off a bunch in your hand. It, it felt like a million times. Like Did, the, even like the first time, it felt like a million you, times. So you you were pulling the trigger somehow? No, no. like it, it's like he had his hand, and my hand was like, I, I I couldn't even tell you how. Like it was it was. Okay. But 
it, it was his force that was making, making the, it go off. Yeah. Okay. Were you hitting anyone? I, I don't I don't know. I, I Come on, it's important this is important. Okay. You're doing a good job. If 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 you're probably, if you're like this and you're doing it, you know that you're hitting the person in front of you. Well, it, we it, we weren't really like in front of anybody. Were you near anyone? It was it was almost back, like in the middle of them in the door. Okay, well, somebody was found in that area. Are you sure there's no one by you? I I, I couldn't. Okay. Okay. It's so, like I'm throw up. Okay. Okay. Did the gun went off a bunch of times? Did it, did it stop? Did it run out of bullets? I I don't I, I couldn't tell you I was just so I was so okay. scared. Okay. It was then what happened? It's like it just felt like it was like like a like a blackout almost you know like sure. everything like just okay. you know like hypnotized kind of like you know but I all I can remember I was just like you know I started I was screaming and like you know and just like you know I I kept trying to like you know like pull pull away but like. But I couldn't because I felt like just like spaghetti almost. Right. Okay. So what happened after all that? And then I ran, or I I didn't I didn't run yet, but he kept. Um, then I I heard like like I I heard like shots, but but it wasn't from my gun. It was or the one that that he gave me because like I I was like holding on to it and then and then like. I'm trying to remember like how this happened because I remember it was just like it was so quick. Like I heard like other like the shots like going off. From his gun, I guess. I I, I, I don't I don't know what kind I mean, of. There wasn't a third person it, shooting. It, no, no. Okay. It it's just everything was like it, everything got like you know like quiet like but you know how like in the in the movie statement private ryan you can uh -huh. hear like shooting but like you can't hear like anything else right you know like you can hear people or whatever and then um and then uh i'm sorry i'm just trying to i know you are to, just to calm down i know you are <laughs> Can I just wait until I finish my cigarette, please? I'm, I feel like I'm going to throw up. Okay. I still keep hearing his voice and seeing his face in my head every time I'm, I, I speak to you. So is she saying she felt like the gun went off a million times, but when asked if she hit anyone, she's acting like she couldn't see and she doesn't know? Even though the gun in her perspective went off a million times. So we're supposed to believe that the million times the gun went off all those times, it never hit anyone. Then Christine said that she ran outside with her gun in her hands and Chris behind her. He threatened he would kill her and her family if she told anyone what they had done. Then he shook her and said he shot Marcus to prove Marcus couldn't kick his ass. And he killed all of Marcus's friends because he didn't want any witnesses. But Chris wasn't sure everyone was dead, so he returned to the crime scene and made sure the job was finished. As you may have heard, Christine kept saying that everything happened so fast. Right, so fast that it's hard to believe that it went the way that she was explaining it. We know from where the shell casings were, police believe these shots happened as soon as the killer walked through the door. Finally, Christine said she pulled away from the Millbridge Drive home, dropped Chris off at his house, and showed up at 3.55 to work at the Walgreens makeup counter. It was only when she arrived at work that she saw small specks of blood on her hands. After that, she spent time with Chris because she was scared of him. Really? She was so scared. She didn't call the cops. Right. And these are supposed to be friends of hers, her best friends that have just been murdered. And I have some questions. For one thing, why were they wearing black? Right. Okay, because we know if this wasn't planned, then why come prepared in clothing that's harder to recognize as not recognizable? You know, if someone's wearing a color, you can say they were wearing orange pants. But if they're wearing black, it's like, ugh, it's a little bit harder. And why would the autopsy reports include so many gunshots from two guns, not just from one as she's making it appear? Why were Tiffany and Dell found on the couch relaxing with no sign of a struggle at all? When in Christine's version, Tiffany was at Rachel's side. I mean, if we can see this isn't true, you know police knew this wasn't the case. But first, they needed to arrest Chris Schneider and fast. 
They couldn't find Chris at his house, but they were able to locate his sister, Brandy. They questioned her for six hours about Chris's criminal history, his gun usage, and relationship with Christine. Brandy insisted Chris was innocent. She said her brother was a sweet, kind, generous man who held the door for women and helped out everyone around the house. Do people not realize that killers can have multiple qualities, some of which are not as evil? We've seen it so many times, but I'm guessing a loved one doesn't want to believe that someone they care about could be responsible for something so heinous. Exactly. And Brandy went on to explain that when Chris was 12 years old, he was hit by a truck while playing football in the street outside of his home. This left him with developmental differences in the maturity level of a 15-year-old for the rest of his life. He had plans to work with animals or play in the NBA, and despite his history of theft and drug usage, Chris was trying to turn his life around. Right, but this is also according to his own sister. Nobody had seen any records yet or anything else. When asked about guns, Brandy said Chris had used his stepdad's guns before. His stepdad lived in Louisville, Kentucky, and at this point, the police filed for a search warrant. What was interesting about what Brandy said was that she insisted Christine was the bad influence. She said whenever Chris hung out with Christine, she wanted to get high and he made bad decisions whenever he smoked marijuana. So Chris didn't have any friends and Christine had such low self-esteem that they dragged each other down. Brandy said Christine was psycho. And if Chris so much looked at another woman, Christine would hit him because she was so jealous, over the top jealous. Brandy said that once Christine even slept in the driveway and threatened to kill Chris's entire family if he didn't get back together with her after they had an argument. Brandy said Chris was scared of two things, the cops and Christine. But she said that now Chris was in such a better place because he lived in Kentucky and he was nowhere near Christine. For six months now, Chris had been in a talking stage with a woman named Michelle Henderson on MySpace. He didn't want any kids of his own, but Michelle had two kids and he adored them. She was 36 and a bartender at the Blind Horse Saloon in South Carolina. They had only met in person three times. The first time, Chris had gone to Michelle's. The second time, Michelle came over for a weekend. And now, Chris was on another trip to South Carolina. As of three weeks ago, they were officially boyfriend and girlfriend. Oh, isn't that nice? He kills four people, but good for him that he found someone to love him and that he's happy. Well, police headed to Greenville, South Carolina to arrest him. And of course, Brandy called Chris to tell him that there was a warrant out for his arrest. Sure she did. Just three days after Christine was arrested on July 21st, police pulled up at Michelle's home. Michelle said Chris was gone. He had stolen a bottle of her prescription painkillers, including Xanax and Oxycodone. He ran into the woods behind her house, wearing only shorts and a muscle tee. He hadn't brought his wallet or car keys, and she was concerned about his safety. She's concerned for his safety. Mm -hmm. She has no idea who she's sleeping with at night. Talk about sleeping with the enemy. But of course, the police are more concerned about solving this case than Chris's well-being at this point. So back in Texas, they searched Chris's stepdad's house, and they found a gun safe. And inside were two weapons, a pistol and a revolver which matched up perfectly with the bullets that were used at the crime scene. So these guns were taken in for processing. The police put out a call for tips, saying a dangerous felon was on the run. They needed Chris's story so they could implicate Christine in the crime. Brandy didn't think Chris was on the run. She interviewed newspapers and posted on social media begging for Chris to just turn himself in. When he didn't respond for a week, she tipped off the police that she was the one who called Chris and said there was a warrant out for his arrest. He'd historically talked about taking his own life in the past, and she wondered if this had sent him over the edge. She's concerned about him, and I get that she cares about him, but again, I'm shocked that she doesn't realize what he's been implicated in, what they're saying that he's a part of. But of course, if it was my sibling, I would care whether they were about to take their life. Yeah, police realized they may be looking for a body. So they put together a search team of bloodhounds and cadaver dogs. And on August 5th, 2006, at 7.30 a.m., they found a 21-year-old man in the woods outside of Michelle's home. He had the same clothes and description as Chris. However, he was in fact deceased. It turned out he had overdosed on the painkillers that Michelle told police he had taken. He took the coward's way out, and he left Christine behind to deal with the aftermath. When Rachel's dad, George, found out that his daughter's murderer was dead, he felt Chris got what he deserved. 
But Marciella, Del's mom, wished that Chris hadn't taken his own life. She wanted to know why he had done what he did to those four innocent people. But if he took his own life, it was possible he could have been harboring guilt. He felt guilty. Maybe he was just an accomplice and Christine had talked him into doing it. But now they would never know. The Houston PD teamed up with Texas prosecutors to put together the details of the massacre. They processed the handguns at the Houston Crime Scene Laboratory. DNA testing found blood on the guns matching the victims. They also had Chris's fingerprints and traces of his DNA. However, Christine's prints and DNA were not on the guns. Well, that's kind of interesting to me. It is. Then they looked into Christine's phone records, and there were thousands of calls between her and Chris. Christine initiated the majority of the calls before and after July 18th. Again, I find this interesting. Why would she be initiating calls after the murders if she said she was trying to distance herself from Chris? Wasn't she scared of him? Or had they both been active participants in this crime all along? To find out more, the police talked with Christine's family. Her mother, Lori, and her stepdad, Tom, said Christine was a victim of this massacre just as much as Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus, and Dell. And, um, I would not say that. I would not go as far as saying that you can compare this living, breathing person to four victims who were executed and can never take another breath. But they explained that Christine had been so upset after the crime that she couldn't even make it to the funeral. But is that really why she didn't go? I mean, we don't know that. She didn't want to get caught. Exactly. And in their version of events, they put their best foot forward for their little miss irresistible. Just like Brandy had done with Chris in her version. In Lori's version, she said Chris was unhinged. He wasn't nice to Christine and he preyed on her for her low self-esteem. Lori said she tried to get him rearrested, but it didn't work. So she grounded Christine and that also didn't work. Christine snuck out to see him anyway. Lori said Christine was a troubled kid and she once tried to run away from home. She'd been charged alongside Chris back in 2004 for stealing a car. But Lori knew in her heart that Christine wasn't capable of murder. Chris was the bad influence. And even Rachel and Tiffany knew that. Apparently, Rachel and Tiffany told Christine that she was way out of Chris's league. They thought she should date a guy who was nicer to her. Christine thought her friends were just jealous that they were against her and trying to take away a good thing. And as for Christine's husband, he knew secrets about her that no one else did. Oh, wait, I totally forgot that she was married to another guy at this point. Uh Uh-huh, Justin Rott. And Justin told police in a statement that Christine never graduated high school. She walked the stage in 2003 along Rachel and Tiffany, but she didn't have enough credits to actually graduate. So she was supposed to enroll in summer school, but she decided not to go. Instead, Christine relied on her trust fund from her dad's life insurance policy following his death. When she turned 18, she received $400,000 and Christine decided to invest in real estate and buy a condo, as well as do drugs. Christine went to three different rehabilitation facilities in 2004 for heroin and cocaine usage. In November, she went to a treatment facility in Kerrville, Texas, where she met Justin. That's probably not the best place to get involved romantically with someone. And I mean, I know what happens, but there are bound to be challenges with two people in a very vulnerable place in life. Right. And actually, there is a strict rule in 12-step addiction programs that you don't date in the first year if you're trying to get clean. It usually inhibits recovery, especially when both people are in the relationship to have the same battle of battling addiction. Interesting. I actually never heard that before, but I think there is an emphasis on both people being in the process of battling the addiction. However, I can see how added pressure of a new relationship can cause issues because you're trying to stay clean, but then what if you get in a fight and then you're going to turn to drugs or alcohol again? Right. And Justin and Christine felt very much in love and decided to do what's best for sobriety together to help each other and to keep one another accountable. They got married on March 22nd, 2005, four months after they met, and lived in Clear Lake until the fall of 2005. That's when the hurricane hit, so they moved to Arlington, and then their relationship started to fall apart. Right, because remember, they were found in that dirty motel room with their poor starving dog and the dog feces all over the place. In the fall of 2005, they were consumed by addiction. Using Christine's money, they bounced from hotel to motel in San Antonio. They only ever left the room to use an ATM, buy snacks, buy fast food, and buy heroin. Christine sold the condo she had bought to her stepdad, Tom, and she and Justin spent their days watching TV and doing drugs. 
Then, in December of 2004, Christine told Justin her biggest regret. She admitted what had happened to her friends that evening in July, back in 2003. She said hysterically that she went to her friend's house the year before to buy drugs and to get high with her boyfriend, Chris. And Tiffany, Rachel, and two young men ended up dead. Christine told Justin she willingly went inside the house, but Chris was responsible for everything. Justin was in the honeymoon phase and he thought Christine could do no wrong and was flattered that she would even open up to him about this traumatic event. And he wouldn't be afraid of her? Because I would be very concerned, especially if she hadn't come forward about this case. Talk about impaired judgment. And the murders were still unsolved. But then in July of 2005, they were watching a TV broadcast for the anniversary of the shootings when Christine pointed to the TV and asked Justin if one of the composite sketches looked like her. And then she started to cry because it did resemble her and that scared her. So Christine confessed to Justin that she and Chris parked down the street from Tiffany's house, that Chris brought guns and wanted to steal drugs and money, that he gave her a gun and she put it in her purse. Rachel answered the door and Christine entered the house first with Chris following behind. Rachel took Christine to get the drugs from the back room where Marcus stored them. That's when Christine broke down crying and told Rachel she was so sorry. She didn't want to hurt anyone. And she said that Rachel was, of course, confused. Then Chris yelled for everyone to get back in the living room. Christine came back to the living room with Rachel, and that's when Chris took out his gun. He told everyone to stay near the couch and told Christine to take out her gun. Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus, and Dell pleaded for their lives. They begged them not to kill them and told Chris and Christine they could take any drugs they wanted. But Chris went rogue. He shot Marcus, then Dell, and then Christine said with tears streaming down her face that she shot Tiffany and Rachel. Then they sprinted away from the house, throwing the drugs in the car. But as they drove away, they realized that while Tiffany and Dell received fatal shots to the head, Rachel and Marcus might still be alive. Wow. But wait a minute. Rachel and Tiffany were shot between the legs. That doesn't sound like the heat of the moment. It doesn't. It seems very planned and intentional, especially that area. Christine said that she and Chris actually went back into the house. They saw Rachel lying on the floor, gasping and choking on her own blood. Christine told Justin that is when she beat Rachel over the head again and again with the gun until she was dead. She felt like she had to. Otherwise, Rachel would turn her into the police. Christine told Justin that afterward, the guns were kept in a safe at Chris's dad's house. And this was a fact that Justin could not have known because police never mentioned they had found murder weapons. Justin said that he had been the one to call the anonymous tip to the police. That may be a lie. Right, because Justin claimed he heard this story in July of 2005. So why would he wait an entire year to call in the tip? Also, Justin never went to Starlight Rehab, and the man on the tip line said that that is where he met Christine. Third, Justin was in the middle of a long drug binge with Christine when he claimed to have called the police. He didn't leave the motel enough to even walk his dog, let alone call Crime Stoppers and give a coherent confession. But one thing was clear. Justin wanted to divorce Christine now that she was in prison for murder. Either he had enough on his conscience to give a statement against his wife, or he had been using her for her money and he didn't care what happened to her now. He was most likely using her in some way to fuel his addiction. Either way, his testimony was very important. Christine requested bail on April 20th of 2007 after a year of the state gathering evidence. Her bail was set to $500,000 on May 9th, and her lawyers appealed, requesting the bail be lowered to $150,000 so she could stay at home on house arrest until her trial. Her stepdad, Tom, insisted that she would be supervised at his house and on four different medications. Nope. I don't think so. The appeal was denied. This reminds me of Jennifer Crumbly right now. She wanted to stay on house arrest at her lawyer's house instead of going to prison. Wow. So Christine was deemed a flight risk and she remained in Harris County Jail until her trial in September of 2008 when Christine faced prosecutors Goodhart and Fryer, a 12-person jury, and Honorable Judge Mark Kent Ellis. Her defense attorneys were DeGruen, Peterson, and Isbell. Christine pleaded not guilty. She blamed the murders on Chris and she maintained her story from her third statement that Chris had stolen the drugs from Marcus and killed him 
to prove he wasn't scared. Chris forced Christine to participate and killed everyone else because they were bystanders. The prosecution claimed that Christine was just as responsible as Chris in these murders. Their evidence was in the autopsies. Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus, and Dell had all been hit with two different types of bullets. There were two shooters firing at the same time. Goodhart argued, quote, it defies logic that this gun is emptied first and this gun is emptied second. When you got multiple gunshots from both guns in the two kids in the couch who never moved, these two guns were fired simultaneously, end quote. And it must have been done in rapid succession. Otherwise, Tiffany and Dell would have gotten up from the couch. It makes sense. And the neighbors, Michelle and Craig Lackner, testified at court that the young man and woman that they saw going into Tiffany's house were indeed Chris Schneider and Christine Paolila. She was wearing a blonde wig with a black headband. Out of a series of six photos, they picked Chris as a perpetrator, and they testified that Christine had been carrying a purse. And it was large enough to hold a gun, even though they weren't sure it contained a gun because they hadn't seen one. Another neighbor testified that she heard gunshots at 3.17 p.m. Next was DNA analyst Laura Gunn. She said there were no fingerprints or DNA evidence showing Christine had held one of the guns, but Christine could have been wearing gloves. Chris could have wiped down the weapons to destroy the evidence and gotten his DNA and fingerprints on the guns after he wiped them when he was transporting them to storage. That was my exact thought because fingerprints are much easier to wipe than tiny remnants of blood because right. blood can still be swabbed even if it's not detectable by the human eye. Christine's ex-husband, Justin Rott, repeated his statement for the jury. The defense tried to paint him as a horrible person who snitched on his wife so he could get a cash reward and do more drugs. Allegedly, Justin was testifying so he could get immunity from being charged with heroin possession. They brought in several witnesses who claimed Justin targeted women and 12-step programs to date and take advantage of their money. Wow, so he's kind of like the Tinder swindler, but instead he's like the rehab romancer. <laughs> right. But who really cares if Justin was trustworthy or not? There's clear evidence placing Christine at the scene of the crime. Before members of the jury actually admitted that at the beginning of the trial, they thought Christine was innocent. But by the end, they realized Christine's story was weak. And if you do take a look at the pictures of her, you know defense attorneys clean up their clients. So she's wearing this nice, like, long sleeve shirt with a collar and a headband and most likely a wig and just looking very different than the person you see in the interview. So the jury realized that Christine's story didn't match up with the evidence. Rachel's mother said Christine looked cold and she didn't have remorse, and she didn't testify, and she was crying. But the only time she cried was when her life was on the line. She never apologized to the families. And even if Chris was wholly responsible, these were her best friends, and she didn't seem to care at all. On October 13, 2008, Christine was found guilty of capital murder. Since she was 17, when the crimes were committed, she wasn't eligible for the death penalty but it took a jury less than three hours to sentence her to life in prison. Christine tried to appeal on six counts, mostly because she made her statements while she was going through withdrawals, and she would have done anything to get more heroin. But law enforcement testified that she was calm, coherent, and calculated during the statements. She never complained about going through withdrawals, just that she felt sick talking about the murder because that would make anyone sick. Christine only shook when she was crying. Christine's sentence was affirmed. She appealed again in 2011, but she's going to be in prison for life. If she does give a confession, she'll be eligible for parole in 2046 when she's six years old. But before we leave, we want to share what prosecutors believe really happened based on the evidence. And what we know, it's believed that Christine was a very jealous person who held a lot of resentment towards anyone she deemed better than her. She had been dating Chris for months, but Rachel and Tiffany weren't fans of her boyfriend, and she didn't understand why. Then Rachel and Tiffany graduated without her. Even though these two women befriended her when no one else would, they shielded her from being bullied, and they were genuinely here for her. After high school, people grow apart. And Rachel and Tiffany had new friends at their new job, and they were spending all their time with Marcus and Dell without Christine. So Christine hatched a plan to get back at her friends. She convinced Chris to bring his stepdad's guns, and they dressed in black as if committing a robbery. When Rachel answered the door, Christine fired. 
Rachel ran back inside and Christine advanced with Chris behind her. They killed Tiffany and Dell, shot Marcus and shot Rachel while Christine aimed for their pelvic areas. She wanted to target their beauty and their popularity and she wanted to punish them for leaving her behind. I know this sounds far-fetched, but there are a lot of clues to back this up. When they ran out of bullets, Rachel and Marcus were still alive. Christine hit Rachel over the head with her revolver. It's unknown who hit Marcus. Chris had a violent streak and he assisted his girlfriend every step of the way. If there were hard drugs in that house, they were never found. But Chris and Christine didn't make off with money or marijuana. Christine entered the house because she wanted her friends dead, not just because she wanted drugs. In fact, police assumed the crime had to do with drugs, but it really didn't. Christine's addiction to heroin had nothing to do with premeditated murder. There was another aspect of this case that had been explored as well as a motive. And here's a picture of Rachel and Christine. And if you're watching... That's Christine by Rachel's abdomen area with her teeth around Rachel's thong underwear, pulling it out of her jeans. This, coupled with notes they found that Christine wrote to Rachel, there was speculation that Christine was into Rachel as more than just a best friend, that there were some romantic feelings there, and even an obsession with her, an obsession surrounding Rachel's beauty and sexuality. The killings were done in such a brutal way that police concluded they were done with a deep hatred. The crotch wounds indicated evidence of sexual envy. Friends who knew her said that she was intensely jealous of Rachel's natural beauty and Tiffany's. And this photo was one reason Christine wasn't questioned as thoroughly early on in this investigation, because this picture had been mislabeled as being of Tiffany and Rachel, not Christine and Rachel. It was seen as two friends just goofing around while drinking. If they would have known it was someone else, someone that close to Rachel, things would have possibly progressed differently. There were other signs Christine was unstable. When it came to how she would respond to Chris, if she thought that he thought anyone was prettier than her, it was evident that she had deep-seated issues with self-esteem. She would slap him or punch him and question him if he looked at another girl. Actually ask him, do you think that she's prettier than me? Wow. Chris had also confided in family and friends about Christine's compulsive obsession with sex. She would demand rough sex in a fashion that would be like almost punishment to her. She would apparently also demand anal sex as punishment as well, and Chris had expressed his opinions that he felt it was dirty and didn't want to do it, but felt like he had to because that's what she wanted. There were other bizarre things that happened. Like once during a fight, she backed him into a wall and was screaming at him. And then all of a sudden she stops and she licks his face from his chin upward, like across his nose and his forehead. And then she spit on the ground. She walked away and said, don't F with me. I'm a crazy woman. Also, just three weeks before the murders, Christine went to Tiffany's for her birthday party And she found out that Chris had been over there buying drugs from Marcus. And she realized that this meant that Chris was over there and could have been hanging out with Tiffany and Rachel. And this really upset her. She didn't want Chris talking to other girls, especially those two girls specifically without Christine there. Just the thought of this infuriated her that he could be going over there and hanging out. So later, when Chris wanted some drugs and mentioned going to Christine's homegirl's house, meaning Tiffany... Christine got pissed. She kept asking him, why do you want to go over there? There's other dealers. Chris insisted it was because Marcus had really good stuff, but Christine thought otherwise. Yeah, that's a lot of insecurity right there. Rachel, Marcus, and Tiffany were buried at Forest Park East Cemetery in 2003. Dell was buried at Brookside Memorial Park. His portrait was painted in a Houston mural along with the portrait of his friend Sergio, who also passed away in the early 2000s. The families of these four kids waited five years for justice to be served. They will never move on from the horror that struck Clear Lake, but they have found solace in one another. In some cases, families grieve privately. Other families speak regularly with the newspapers. Both ways of grieving are important and valid. We can't really know how we would react if we were in the same position. In cases with multiple families involved, some platforms focus on one victim more than others. And sometimes, of course, they're trying to really dig into the mind of the killer. But it's important for us to cover this case and cases like it so you can meet the most important people involved, Rachel, Tiffany, Marcus, and Dell. 
They were loved, and we hope you remember them. You never know who will stab you in the back, or if you will fall victim to a crime just because you were there. They didn't deserve this, but they deserve to be remembered. So stay safe out there, and thank you so much for your empathy and your presence today. And we will see you in our next video. Bye. Bye.